I want to keep this very inter interactive, um, and I have a bunch of slides, but you know I don't need to get through them. I just want to make sure that people leave kind of with a you know good understanding of what's what's the the inherited basis or how to approach a complex disease in terms of thinking about the genetics. And I'm going to focus on the disease that we worked on, heart attack, but the principles are relevant to really every disease uh, that has a genetic and, let's say, a lifestyle component, a complex disease. OK, so let's start with just thinking through um, a patient, actually, because we a lot of our work, at least, and a lot of the work here at the Broad um, is inspired by specific problems, right, human, human disease problems. And uh, here's one. Uh, this is a, a 42-year-old male who presented with dizziness and profuse sweating. And what you can see here, and this is the actual ambulance sheet for that person. A stretcher brought into the residence. The patient was getting ready for transfer from the chair to the stretcher when he started posturing, having a seizure. And the patient was subsequently transported into the ambulance unit. And inside the ambulance uh, had this heart rhythm on the monitor, and that's ventricular fibrillation. So this is um, uh, very chaotic activity emerging from the ventricles, the two bottom chambers of the heart. And uh, this, uh, and this uh, is, not a, is a rhythm that is not compatible with blood pressure life. So he was shocked out of this rhythm. And then see this, and this is uh, an EKG that shows evidence of an acute heart attack. And the patient was actually treated for this heart attack. Uh, heart attacks are caused by blockages in the heart arteries, which we'll talk about in a minute. But the tip, one of the treatments in, the, in this situation is to go in and, and try to basically clear the blockage from within the artery. And that was done, an angioplasty and stent. The artery was opened. But uh, during all of this, the patient had suffered a fair amount of anoxic brain injury um, during the resuscitation and actually died 10 days into the hospital course. So this is a 42-year-old individual with um, fatal early onset myocardial infarction. Um, these are some of the risk factors. So HDL a little low, triglycerides a little high, family history, uh, father with an MI at a young age, uh, 54. If you take that information and put it into a risk calculator, um, this is what doctors are asked to do when they see patients um, in the clinic uh, in terms of assessing risk for heart attack. Um, you, can, you can Google this. This is called the pooled cohort risk equation, and you can put your numbers in. And um, what you end up getting is a 10-year risk of having a problem, of having a heart attack or dying from heart disease. In this patient, it was 1.7%. So that's considered low risk. And his doctor, actually, a few months prior to having him having had the problem, had basically said, OK, you're low risk, have a you know, lifestyle, and so forth. But we know that several months later, he actually had a fatal heart attack. So uh, exposes some of the limitations of using this kind of risk scoring to understand somebody's 10-year risk of having a problem, particularly in young people. Um, OK, so that's that's. Um, the clinical disease that we focused on, uh, and that disease is, this disease is very much like a lot of the other common complex diseases, has both an inherited and a lifestyle component. I'm going to give you some background. Um, um, I'm going to give you some background about um, the disease and also how we've approached the disease from a genetics perspective. Again, stop me anytime in terms of questions. Um, so uh, the disease, I said, is, is heart attack or myocardial infarction. And this is a disease of the arteries um, that run on the surface of the heart. So this is the heart muscle. There are three arteries, major arteries that run on the surface of the heart, shown here. Here's one of those arteries in cross-section. And the disease itself is a disease of the wall of the artery. There's buildup of gunk, basically plaque, in the wall of the artery over several decades. So it's a chronic, there's a chronic component, chronic phase to the disease. And then there's an acute component, which is the inner lining of the blood vessel bursts, plaque rupture, it's called, and exposing the subendothelial collagen to flowing blood. And that's a very potent trigger for blood clotting, for thrombosis. So what happens is, at a given time point, you have that plaque rupture, the blood clots, it stops blood flow from going further down the channel, 
And so the heart, part of the heart that's served by that, that artery might die. And it, that happens if, if the blockage is there for more than about 20 minutes. So that death of heart tissue is a heart attack. It's myocardial, that myocardial necrosis is a heart attack. And that can be detected by symptoms, EKG change, and a blood test, uh, elevation in cardiac biomarkers. So uh, this is the leading cause of death worldwide. Um, so how, when we have a disease like this, you know, uh, this disease or any other, any of your favorite diseases, how do, we, how do we think about the role of genetics? How do we know that genes actually play a role? Right? So that's often the first question we all start with. So when I got started in the field, um, whatever, 20-some years ago, for coronary artery disease, um, this was the question. If your mother or father had a history of early onset cardiovascular disease, what is the fold increase in personal risk to you? This is the starting question for a lot of, lot of people. Um, so you can, get, you can get at the role of genes by doing this, asking this kind of question. You can do a formal heritability analysis. You can do segregation analysis. There's a several approaches, basically, to get at whether a disease has a genetic component. So that's the starting point. So for this disease, we just uh, the question has been about family history. And this question actually was answered, or at least the initial answer goes way back, actually, to somebody named Paul Dudley White, who was uh, uh, the founder of the cardiology division at Mass General Hospital. Actually, it's considered like the father of American cardiology. He, uh, in, in the early 1900s, um, the EKG had been invented in Europe in the UK and uh, in Germany, and he, about 10 years after the initial demonstration of the EKG, he brought that technology over to the United States in the early 1920s, and then uh, kind of established kind of modern cardiology in the US, and founded the American Heart Association, one of the founders of the National Institutes of Health. So really, uh, very prime, it was the, the, I don't know if you guys know, but Eisenhower had a heart attack while in office. and. Uh, Dr. White was the cardiologist uh, to uh, President Eisenhower. Okay, so he ended up, was, it was interested in this question of uh, inherited component because he noticed in his patients uh, who had a um, heart attack at a young age, and he actually used a very early cutoff, 45. So men and women before the age of 45, he just looked simply to see what proportion of their parents actually had a problem, had that same problem, had a heart attack. And notice that about 15%, uh, I don't know what's going on, about 15% um, of the, um, the, um, the individuals with the coronary group, he called it, those are the people who had early heart attack, had a parent that had the problem, and a, and a smaller proportion, 6% of the so roughly two, two to three-fold higher prevalence of, of parents having the problem in, in the early MI people versus the control group. And this, is, this was published, I think, what, 1950? The original paper is in 51. This is a, a book in 1954. So it's held up. That two-fold, roughly, effect size for family history has you know, just reproduced over and over again. And the initial observation was literally just in a couple hundred patients of adult Dr. White. Um, okay, so family history um, demonstrated here as a role. And that suggests that differences in DNA sequence could contribute to differences in risk for MI, right? Because families shared DNA. So an open question for you all is, uh, you know, is that what else could be going on in terms of the family history? Does family history kind of, is it synonymous with, with essentially DNA? Yeah, so families share a lot more than just their DNA, right? They share their lifestyle um, and early environment often before the kids leave off. So. It, it doesn't, just because you see that family history plays a role in a disease doesn't automatically mean that it has to be a, an inherited component, it has to be a genetic, a, a germline DNA component. It gives you some clue, but it, it's absolutely not kind of a, 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 a sine qua non. So, um, and you'll see that that's the case here as well. But, okay, so 
But beyond the family history component, there's been formal heritability analyses. So this is a heritable trait. Roughly 30, 40% of the intra-individual variability in risk for this disease is thought to be due to the germline DNA. Okay, differences in germline DNA. And that number, that heritability of let's say 40%, it's pretty consistent for a range of common complex diseases. Okay, all, all the common diseases you think about, you know, Alzheimer's, lung, lung disease, you know, other forms of heart disease, rheumatoid arthritis, you know, all, this, all these diseases, roughly 40, 30 to 50%, let's say, heritability. Okay, so you'll never go, long, go wrong rest, guessing a heritability of like 40%. Um, okay, now we want to understand, so we want to isolate which differences in the DNA may be responsible for that familial clustering, right? About 3.2 billion letters in the DNA sequence. Which ones, which specific bases are responsible for this familial clustering? So that's the question actually when, when Chris and I started in, in this field in like the late 90s, uh, we were, you know, there was no genome sequence. Um, we were just starting to actually get an understanding of the differences between people, like catalogs of differences through uh, the SNP map and uh, ultimately the haplotype map. And, and so, but this whole field of like, oh, wh what are the differences and how do they relate to disease risk for common complex diseases was just starting, okay? And to summarize, like a lot of different approaches on a single slide, uh, this is roughly how to, how to think about, um, this is annoying, um, roughly how to, uh, let me just see if I can get rid of my, I thought I heard. Um, roughly to think about, hold on one second. Where's the messages thing? Um, how to think about, um, essentially solving uh, the genetic component of a common complex disease, okay? On the x-axis, you've probably seen this, uh, many of you, but we'll take a few minutes just to go through this. So um, on the x-axis is the frequency of, of the mutation or polymorphism or the variant allele, right? So those are all terms that you know, people kind of somewhat use inter interchangeably. But you know, if you think about uh, this, the human genome sequence, mm, mm, take a specific spot on chromosome one, most people in the world will have the same letter. Right? Some small fraction will have a different letter. And this is just ca calculating the frequency of the population that has that different letter, right? The minor allele. And that can be very rare, one in 10,000, one in 100,000. That can be very common, 40, 50% of the population has. And when it's very common, over 1%, those are called polymorphisms, just by convention. Less than 1% typically considered mutations, right? That's the term that's used. Now, um, so that's the allele, rift frequency allele. On the y-axis is how big of an effect that variant allele has on disease risk, from very small effect to very large effect, okay? So you have um, a set of approaches that are useful for finding alleles in the population that are very common and have a, typically have a modest effect on disease risk. By modest, I mean like 10%, 20% increase in risk based on carrying the allele, 30% increase in risk. Then you have another set of approaches that are very good at detecting rare mutations of very large effect. Okay, And historically, the last 20 years, the way to get at these common variants, and here I'm just giving you a, a, a definition of one in 20 is common. So 5% of, of the population or greater has the, rare, uh, has the, has the uh, variant, allele, variant allele. And you have a set of approaches that are very good at detecting common variants of modest effect, and, then, and that's typically been genotyping arrays. Right? So why is that? Why do we, like, again, going back to Chris and my experience, uh, we were we were like in 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 the thick of it when the first genome-wide association studies were done uh, 
kind of testing, a screening a set of common variants across the genome for association with the given disease. Um, so why do you think we started there? What did those studies involve in terms of characterizing the genetic, uh, the genotype? I'm going to have to pick on people. Yep. So uh, there are comments that are on haplotype C that show a small number of loci. Yeah, I think that gets an important point is that they're, they're sorry? Oh, yeah. So the, his, his answer was um, they're, they're common, so you can probe, at a, probe a small number of haplotypes to get at um, the variation. And so that's, I think, a, a pretty good answer. Um, the idea here is that the, these variants, right, are frequent in the population, so maybe 20, 30 percent of the people or 5 percent. And you can look at a limited number of individuals, make a catalog of all the sites that are common, okay, and then figure out how to determine in any given person whether those sites are variable or not. So you don't have to look at essentially every site in the genome. You can look at a very small number of people, catalog the sites that vary frequently, and then use this technology, genotyping chip technology, array technology, that was the first available, essentially, to look at uh, DNA variation in a large number of people, use that to just probe the sites that vary frequently. So the initial chips had about 100,000 variants on them, not 3.2 billion you know, uh, sites. Uh, so about 100,000 sites that you could probe whether somebody carried uh, at that spot a given letter or an alternate letter. Then it became a little larger, half a million, and now typically the chips have roughly one to two million spots. Okay, now what are these, um, and there's several generations of chips, one, uh, they're often, genome-wide association study is the approach, it's called GWAS chip, it's also, uh, there's some chips that had basically just coding content, but details are not that important. But generally, they're genotyping arrays. So what are the strengths and limitations of these genotyping arrays for detecting variation in the genome? Yep. You don't detect rare, rare variation. Yeah. So, you, you know, there's, a, uh, there's like an infinite reservoir of rare variation in the human population. So every given base basically will likely be mutated in somebody. Almost every base, if you if you if you uh, are able to detect it, and that's not what you're getting at here, right? You're getting at just the most frequent variations, and you're cataloging in a very small number of individuals, and you're looking at those only those spots. You have to know where to look for this type of approach to work. If the mutation happens to be in the next spot over in that person, you're not catching it with the genotyping array, right? Okay, so that's pretty important. So that's where we started. And then, but uh, in about 2007, 8, 9, definitely by 9, we were able to apply next-gen sequencing to more, more, more um, catalog, basically characterize much more of the genome. Um, and in every given person, you're actually specifically going and looking at base by base and being able to tell if it's mutated or not, rather than just sticking to the sites that happen to be on the chip. So then that uh, next-gen sequencing has been very useful to look at typically coding sequence initially, the exome, and then now whole genome, okay? So these distinctions about the technologies that we're gonna use to look at common or rare or this middle bucket of low frequency, um, they're kind of historical distinctions in some sense, ultimately, we'll just have one technology to assess genotype, which is whole genome sequence. And then you just use different analysis methods to look at the common or the rare, right? Um, but we're not quite at that transition yet. It's really a cost thing. So if you think about cost to determine genotype, what is the cost right now typically of these, these arrays? Anyone? Thousand dollars, ten dollars. Twenty. Sorry. Twenty. Yeah, it's twenty. <laughs> Good. <laughs> He's in my lap. 
So, um, so uh, yeah, 20 bucks, roughly, for, at scale. Um, what about uh, exome sequencing, which is sequencing of the 30 million bases that make up all the proteins, or most of the proteins? So 1% of the sequence genome, 1% of the genome codes for protein. 18,000 genes, 180,000 exons, 30 million bases, roughly. Yes? About 150? Yeah, about 200 bucks right now. And then what about the genome? Yeah, 800,000, something like that. Okay, so that gives you a sense of this. Uh, so it's a pretty big difference still. The arrays are way cheaper. Um, okay, different approaches to detect um, genotype. And then how do you associate genotype with phenotype? That's really, that's basically human genetics, right? You want to correlate genotype with phenotype. This is one way to check genotype, but how do you relate the genotype to phenotype? Well, uh, that's going to be shown here. There are a couple of study designs. One, again, thinking about common variants of modest effect. And here, typically, the study design has been population studies of association. So you have a bunch of individuals with disease, without disease, and you're comparing site by site the frequency of a given letter in cases compared to controls for site one all the way to site common variant like two million, right? In each site you're comparing. And then you figure out, try to figure out which sites are, is there an excess in cases compared to controls of a given letter with the expectation for most sites in the genome, there's no difference of that letter frequency in cases compared to controls, but for a very small fraction it goes up. Uh, that's higher, let's say, in cases, that would be the risk flavor. So that's the study design. But for rare variants, or for so, so looking at detecting rare variants of large effect, the study design now, and uh, typically, is one of these two. So if the, the disease follows the patterns, of Mendel a pattern of Mendelian segregation, so as if like a single gene is responsible in the family, then you can use a family-based design. But for quantitative traits, you can also try to get these rare variants of large effect by looking at the trait, the extremes of the distribution, taking people with very high, let's say, LDL cholesterol, very low LDL cholesterol, and then sequencing them and looking to see what's the difference in rare mutations in this group versus this group. So those are two different, these are three different study designs, basically to correlate genotype with phenotype. All right, um, so let's jump in then with that as background to give you some, just a flavor for how this is done and, and what some of the results have been for this disease. So we, uh, so if you think about age, somebody has the first heart attack. The patient I showed you had a heart attack at 42. Average age in the United States for a man is 65 and 72 for a woman. And we've actually studied individuals with early disease. Okay, men less than 50, women less than 60. And this is a very commonly used strategy to enrich for genetic signal. If you have the problem at a young age, much more likely to be genetic influence rather than lifestyle over like 30, 40 years of cheeseburgers, you know, for this disease. So we focus on early MI, and we typically have, again, um, enrolled these at this age cutoff, and we started a while back. Um, and we've approached or tried to get at three different paths to early MI. And I think this is a model, that, again, that you could use for really any complex disease. The first, uh, the what best understood when we got into the field was this monogenic model, which I'll, I'll review. Then you have the polygenic model in terms of a path to early disease. And the most recent observation has been somatic mutations for this disease, which I think many of you f will f may find of interest. Typically, somatic mutations are thought of being important in cancer, right? So the key distinction, of course, is germline mutations here. That's the type that you inherit from your parents, right? And then the somatic or acquired mutations are those one that you, you basically, that happens in you during, after birth. So in your development or after birth and or adulthood. 
And so um, we'll, we'll take each of these three uh, models in turn. Okay, so let's talk about the monogenic model and then polygenic and then we'll do the somatic. Okay, so the monogenic model, again, this, this study design is applicable now to a range of diseases. So you should think about how this might be relevant for a problem, a disease you might be interested in. We took 5,000 individuals with heart attack at a young age, 5,000 control individuals, and then sequenced the exome in all 10,000 people. And did this analysis, searching for risk mutation signal across each of the 18,000 genes. So what does that analysis look like? Well, you take gene one for you know, a given gene, you basically tally up the number of rare mutations in the coding sequence in the cases, and you get a cumulative frequency of rare mutations in that gene in cases. You do that tally in controls, and you compare. What is the cumulative frequency of rare mutations in cases compared to controls? With the expectation that for a risk gene, there would be more the cumulative frequency of rare mutations in cases would be greater than controls. So pretty, pretty straightforward in terms of conceptually. You do that for gene one, and you do that all the way to gene 18,000. So what are some questions that come up when, when I say that? What are you thinking about in terms of this analysis? You know, comparing the cumulative frequency in cases compared to controls. What are the, um, I guess, analytic issues that you might think about. Yep. Uh, gene size. Okay. What do you, what, and well, how does that, how does gene size? Uh, bigger genes will have more than I think that's good. That's, that's, a, that's a very definitely true. But what about, um, what about this here in terms of um, uh, thinking about how is that, will that impact our, your ability to compare in cases of risk controls? You're right, on average, a larger gene will have more mutations than a smaller gene. But you're doing this comparison of cases and controls gene by gene, right? So, so, so you're gonna look at the proportion of uh, cases who carry a mutation in this large gene Compare that to the proportion of controls who carry mutations of large genes. So it should it shouldn't you know if there's the difference is there or not, and because you're doing a gene level comparison across the cases and controls, right? You're not comparing large genes to small genes, for example. What else? Um, perhaps the the number is not the number of cases and controls not the power is not sufficient to make that uh, distinction, as well as. There could be you know, the population underlying um, ethnicity of the individuals that could play a role in certain groups having additional uh, variation in certain genes. So that could play a role when you're making a comparison between the two. Terrific. So the, her two responses, the two analytic issues are one, um, what if the proportion of individuals uh, in, among the cases, in this case, was half, among the cases was half black? And among the controls was no blacks, all whites, right? That might really impact your analysis, right? Because rare variation, very, rare variation in a given gene has varies dramatically by ethnicity. So that general concept is called you know, population structure or population substructure. And population structure can, is an important confounder, potentially in these analyses. You have to really be, you have to really have pretty good matching for ancestry in terms of the cases versus controls. Otherwise, you could have a spurious correlation just because that gene happens to have more mutations in blacks versus whites. And if you had many more blacks as cases, then you would say, oh, that gene is, increases risk. But it, it's not really the case. It's just because you had a greater number of that ancestry in the cases, okay? So population structure, matching for ancestry is a very important issue. The other issue you mentioned is super important, power. I'm saying, let's 
Let's compare the cumulative frequency of mutations in cases compared to controls rare in a given gene, for rare mutations. But what if in, the, in gene A, only one in 5,000 people actually have a mutation? Well, then you don't have like one person here in, among cases and maybe one among controls. So you'd have no power to actually tell whether there's a difference among cases or controls. So that's a really important issue. And that's actually been the major stumbling block for these kind of studies so far because you're trying to compare things that are rare, rare observations. So you need a very large sample size typically to be able to tell whether there's a difference. Okay. All right, so those are very good uh, issues. What else, what are the analytic issues for this kind of analysis? There are a couple more that I want to get at. Yeah, so that's, I think, important. It, it kind of gets at this power issue so that you, that would submerge your ability. The answer was uh, pa re reduce penetrance. So that's getting at the effect size of the comparison the, the, between cases and controls. And um, if the mutations don't have a very large effect, you're not going to see a very large difference among cases and controls. Yes? Yeah. Your ability to confidently define a case versus a control. That's a good point, yeah. So you could have misclassification. That would affect your power. So what if this is these are people in their 40s and you're labeling them as having not had a heart attack? What if the next day they go on to have a heart attack? You know, so you're like mislabeling people, right? Now that is a very important issue, and, and it turns out that it doesn't affect your power as much as you think it would. Because take the worst case scenario, which is all the people you're labeling as controls is disease free. Let's say they all develop heart attack at the population at the population frequency of heart attack. Right? So the average frequency in the United States. The average frequency of so what, what's the prevalence of heart attack in the United States? Roughly 10%. Okay? So that would mean that you're basically mislabeling 500 of the 5,000. So that decreases your power a little bit, but not as dramatically as you might think, actually. But that's a very important conceptual issue. Now, I've said like, several times, we're going to compare the frequency of rare mutations in cases compared to controls. What about, are, do, are you wondering what mutations are you comparing? All right, so they're all different annotation of mutations, right? Right, the mutation could be, uh, let's say, a missense change. It could be a synonymous change. It could be a stop codon. It could be an essential splice site. Which ones are you bundling together to get at that cumulative frequency? That's a super important kind of question that the field has wrestled with. Why, why, why might that be important? This gets at, I think, Renee's kind of, I guess, penetrance issue. Yep. Oh, uh, you're a ringer. I can't really. OK, go ahead. Some mutations are more potent than others. Yeah, exactly. So if you count, if you look at, um, you really want to enrich for a signal here. So you want to figure out which mutations actually you think are going to have an effect. If you just counted synonymous mutations, which are the ones that don't change amino acid, on average, they have no effect on protein function. So you would never be able to get a signal of cases versus control difference just looking at synonymous mutations, right? In, on average, there are some synonymous mutations that do have an effect on function. So you might say, well, let's, oh, one second, I'll get to you. One second. You might say that let's just um, focus on the ones that are m most likely to uh, uh, have, function, have an effect on protein function. Which ones would those be? Loss yeah, loss of function. So a stop codon. So something that breaks the protein early, you know, a truncation early in the protein, let's say. If you restricted your analysis to only those mutations, that would be pretty good, right? You really hope to see a signal in terms of difference for a given gene that's a risk gene and you know, cumulative frequency of those loss of function mutations in cases compared to controls. What's the challenge there? Exactly. They're very rare, OK? Because there's a very interesting relationship between allele frequency on the x-axis, actually I showed it, allele frequency on the x-axis and effect size on the y-axis, okay? And the, the relationship goes like this, right? So basically the more common a variant is, the less effect it has. 
the rarer the variant is, the larger effect it has. Because most really deleterious mutations are, are evolution, have, have a, that have an effect on protein function are weeded out during evolution, and, uh, and, and there's selective pressure against them, so they tend to be very rare in the population. So that gets back to the somebody said about power, right? So if you, if you only do an analysis of loss of function mutations, you're going to have very few counts in the two, two cells. So that, that's, those are basically some of the analytic issues for this kind of analysis. Um, the one more, which is multiple testing burden. So I'm getting a p-value for a, a, a test of difference between cases and controls of the cumulative frequency of a given set of mutations. And I'm looking at that difference between case and controls for gene one, and I get a p-value for that difference. I do it for gene two. I do it all the way down to gene 18,000. What will be, what do you declare as statistically significant? Oh, sorry, I, 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 I failed to come back to your question. You had a question. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Well, it wasn't a question, it was just a statement about the sound mutations, but you kind of covered that. Oh, then some could. If they're not select, no, if they're not selected for, then they would be equally distributed. Exactly. And controls, and they would kind of fall out. That's right. But so what happens is that adds noise to your your system, though, because you, you're not gonna you're not gonna be able to see the true from. They, they'll drown out any potential signal because there's so many of them that are evenly distributed between the cases and controls. Yeah. Um, okay. So. Uh, where, where, sorry. Yes. What p-value threshold? 0.05. Why not? I mean, roughly, if you choose 0.05, then let's just say it's 20,000 genes. 20,000 times 5%, that's 1,000 genes will exceed 0.05, just by chance. <coughs> so you can't, can't use 0.05. So what, what do you use? What's a rough, what's a rough cutoff? Bonferroni, right? Take 0.05 divided by 20,000. So 2.5 times 10 negative 6. That's roughly where the field is right now in terms of the p-value threshold for these kind of analyses. A gene is declared significant. Now remember, the unit of analysis here is the gene. Right, so you're looking at gene by gene. A gene is declared significant if that, that the p-value for that difference between cases and controls exceeds two and a half times 10 negative six. That's pretty hard to get to, actually. All right, so for, we did this. Okay, so here's the results. Here's the result for coronary artery, uh, early MI. And what I'm showing here on the x-axis are the expected uh, p-values. On the y-axis, the observed p-values. And each dot here is a gene, is a p-value for the comparison between cases and controls for that gene in terms of cumulative frequency of mutations. And I won't go into like what mutations we counted, but, but that's a detail. What do you see? So th these, are, these are good plots to kind of get used to. So this is a QQ plot. So essentially, again, expected, observed. The red line is the null distribution. So if, if there was no signal at all, then every dot would fall along that red line. So what you, can, what you want to look for in these plots is that it's, people say, well calibrated. That means that most of the dots, most of the genes, have no signal. If you saw a plot where Basically, there was an early takeoff here where there was a, for every gene there was an excess in terms of observed versus uh, expected. That would be a problem. That would suggest that you have some widespread artifact or something else, maybe like population structure differences. Or... So here, it's pretty well calibrated, and then there's a takeoff, and there's a few genes that stand out, right? And there's one that really stands out, okay? And that's, um, that gene is low-density lipoprotein receptor, LDL receptor. That's a top signal in the genome for early MI, okay? So this is a gene that's been known about for many years now, the early 70s. And um, so, uh, so lipids, just to let you know, this is, this is uh, triacylglycerol, this is cholesterol. Uh, this is the gene that in, is involved in cholesterol metabolism. Lipids are essential uh, for, for uh, cells, but water insoluble, and we need a transport system to carry these lipids and the body has a transport system, and that, those are called lipoproteins. Uh, the lipoproteins are little spherical balls that carry either cholesterol or triglyceride, cholesterol in orange, triglyceride in blue. LDL is one of these particles that carries cholesterol. And that's what's abnormal here in people who carry 
mutations in the LDL receptor. So the monogenic model for MI basically boils down to these four um, genes, the carrier frequency cumulative of different mutations in uh, cumulative carrier frequency in cases, uh, sorry, in the population, and then which biomarkers altered, and then the clinical effect. Okay, so a couple of things to take away here. For monogenic model, um, the, the prevalence in the population of the mutations is pretty rare, 1 in 250 for, for, um, for LDLR and, and, and less and even rare for these and a little more common here. They all alter a blood biomarker. And then this is the effect size. So when I say large effect, remember that top left rare mutations large effect? This is the fold increase in risk. This is the odds ratio. So these mutations in here, for example, increase risk about 300%, 3.2, Now, this is for this disease. For other diseases, mo the monogenic model may have much larger effects, you know, like, I don't know, cystic fibrosis. It's a recessive model where both, both genes have to, both, both copies have to be broken. But there it's like, the odds ratio is like 300. Okay, like pretty much if you, so almost a one-to-one -one correlation between having two copies of uh, CFTR broken and having cystic fibrosis. For this disease, you can see it's a lot more modest in the monogenic model, but that's, it is what it is. And this, there's, so there's a wide range in terms of between diseases, how, what the effect size is, what people consider large effect. All right. I might only get through monogenic. Okay, so uh, we'll do polygenic, uh, which is what we've worked on for many years now. So this is, uh, and I think a lot of you have heard, heard some of this. So here the issue is additive effect of many variants in aggregate leading to disease, okay? Now, the reason we focus on the monogenic model is that if you take the 5,000 people with early heart attack, only about 4% can you actually find a monogenic mutation? So these are all people who have heart attack in the 30s, 40s, 50s. You sequence them in the coding sequence, and only in about 200 can you actually explain, quote unquote, explain them, find a monogenic mutation. So what's going on in everybody else? That's a lot of people, 4,800 people where heart attack, young age, you don't have a clear genetic explanation, okay? So, so there, we, what we did was look to the, the polygenic model and the question here is not rare mutations, but do the common DNA variants across the genome, how do they contribute to disease risk? And the, the study design is here. Again, cases and controls. A lot more cases and controls, uh, 60,000, 120,000. And the analysis here is done after the genotyping as the approach to get the common variation. So those arrays that I mentioned earlier. So typically what happens is you genotype half a million polymorphisms, let's say, in all these people. But then you're able to actually ascertain even much larger number of variants based on um, the correlation structure among polymorphisms in the genome, this haplotype structure that somebody mentioned earlier. So uh, if you carry a letter at a given spot, let's say here, it might be correlated with carrying another, a, a, a different letter at the spot nearby based on this, the correlation structure in the population. So this is what really was worked on by David Altschul or others here for several years to figure out that correlation structure across the population, create a map of the correlation structure for poly common polymorphisms, this haplotype map. And then we can now take advantage of that. And if you only um, genotype a couple of hundred thousand markers for whites, for example, you can infer all of these other untyped markers based on the uh, correlation structure that's been defined and publicly available. Have you, heard, have you heard about this? What is the approach called? Imputation, statistical imputation. So it's really just like making data up. It's probably not the right way to say it, but, um, but it's, 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 it's actually coming up with untyped polymorphisms, your, your best guess for a polymorphism that you didn't directly experimentally define in that person. Um, but it turns out it's remarkably accurate, like nearly perfect, um, because we now understand that correlation structure so well um, in, in each population. 
each of the major ancestry groups. Okay, so we can genotype uh, several hundred thousand and then get to millions of polymorphisms across the genome that have been typed in the cases and controls. So here's the key conceptual difference between the last analysis and this analysis. What we're going to do here, then, is not look gene by gene, but rather site by site, variant by variant. The unit of analysis in the last was gene. Here, it's polymorphism by polymorphism. So at polymorphism one, you're comparing the frequency of a given letter, the variant letter, in the cases compared to the controls. And then you're doing that comparison all the way to polymorphism, in our case here, 6.6 .6 million. Okay, Com these are all common variants, over 1% variant allele frequency in the population. And what, would, what should happen for most of the polymorphisms? Will there be a difference in terms of the variant allele frequency in cases versus controls? No. For a small fraction, there might be an excess. And those are, uh, those are the, the, the associated variants. So you have the same issues that we dealt with last time of power, of multiple testing burden. What do you consider significant? You're doing 6.6 .6 million tests here. It can't be 0.05. What is significance? And then um, what variants you analyze. The same range of issues, actually, largely. Now, these data, these results are often plotted like this. Okay, so on the x-axis is the, all the chromosomes. On the y-axis is strength of statistical evidence. Here's the genome-wide significance line. Okay, I just kind of dropped that in. What does that mean? I should say that this, each dot here is a signal. Last, remember, the last analysis, each dot was a gene, a p-value for a gene. Here, each dot is a p-value for a SNP, a single site in the genome. And, and, and you can see the top signal here are a stretch of SNPs on this chromosome 9. And on the, again, the y-axis is the p-value for association between that variant and disease risk. Okay. Um, what this threshold line, remember the last threshold we said was take the 20,000 genes, 0.05 divided by 20,000. Here, it's the same thing. It's a Bonferroni threshold correction, but here we're, we're going to have to estimate how many tests are we doing when we test all the common polymorphisms of genome. You could say take 0.05 divided by 6.6 .6 million because that's how many variants you looked at. But it turns out that there's a correlation structure, as I said, between the 6.6 .6 million. So it, there's about 1 million independent tests when you, when you test all common variants in the genome. So the genome-wide threshold is 0.05 divided by 1 million. So 5 times 10 to the negative 8th. That's kind of by, that's been the field standard to date. Okay? So all of these spots exceed that 5 times 10 to the negative 8th, about 95 specific spots in the genome. Okay? So these are the common variant associations for this disease. Now, I only have a couple of minutes. So I'm going to actually, I'll come back. We can have another session, Chris, maybe on polygenic risk scores later. Um, we'll, we can come back and, and think about this. Um, the bottom line, then, is uh, if you think about, uh, if you think about the, the um, I want to just get to the somatic, and then that'll leave you the conceptual framework for, uh, OK. So, those are rare mutations, common variants. Uh, oh, one point about the common variants is that, is that um, what do you do? What do you, where do you go from there? Like, you have a variant. It's often, oh, by the way, there's 95 variants that have been mapped for MI. Um, are they coding, non-coding? What are they typically? Those common variants. Almost all of them are non-coding sequence. They're like in between genes or like upstream of a gene or downstream of a gene. They don't code for protein cha sequence changes. So, so then what do you do? Like you have some SNP in, the, in, a, in a genome that affects risk 1.3%, 1.3-fold, 30% increase in risk. Um, well, that's what we're all wrestling with right now. So you want to understand biology maybe, new, you know, new genetic pathway, new pathways to disease risk based on this unbiased screen across the genome. So there's a lot of work trying to go from the variant to the relevant gene, to the relevant function. And then you also want to potentially use that information to predict disease risk. Well, that's what the polygenic score part was going to be about. Um, and that, actually, there's been some progress, that you can use all these mapped variants to find a subset of individuals that are higher risk. Uh, 
uh, at risk, sometimes it, it, getting approaching the monogenic mutations as well. Okay, so the last part of it is this the somatic mutations. And here, um, the story revolves around uh, blood cells. And blood cells during, you know, your you know, an adult life can acquire mutations in a given gene, a driver mutation, that might give it a clonal growth advantage, selective advantage in terms of growth of the blood cell. And that's, they expand, and then they may acquire additional mutations as well. So a couple of years ago, Sid Jaswal and um, uh, uh, Giulio Genovese and others here at the Broad showed that this process of clonal hematopoiesis, this, uh, these mutations in blood cells, can be detected from exome sequencing of blood tissue. And it's an age-dependent process. Very few young people have these clones. People in the 70s and 80s, about 10% of them have clones. So, and the mutations are spread out in just a few genes, actually, these genes here. And having a mutation ups your risk of having blood cancer, future risk of blood cancer. That's not a surprise. But he also found that it ups risk for coronary heart disease, incident coronary heart disease. So heart attack. And so we went on to try to replicate this, and what we see is that roughly 2% of early heart attack patients actually have a clone. We went into this thinking nobody who's young should have this, because it's an age-dependent process. But about 2% of early MI patients have a clone, and it's detectable from exome sequencing. And, and their risk is very similar to the monogenic model. And what we see is the mechanism is likely through heightened inflammation, um, IL-1 beta pathway. And there may be some therapeutic approaches to actually to target that inflammation, some medicines available that could be given to these patients if you figure out that they have clonal hematopoiesis. Okay, so um, I tried to walk you through uh, the, the, the models, the different models for risk for a common complex disease, monogenic, polygenic, uh, this clonal hematopoiesis, and um, think through some of the uh, approaches to detect variation and then the approach is to correlate the variation to, to phenotype, and then specifically apply that to, to heart disease. Okay, thank you. <laughs>